Chapter 11, The Siege and Fall of Mexico. After Antonio de Villafania had been punished and those who had joined with him in the conspiracy had quieted down, Cortez examined the sloops which were already built and had their rigging, sails, and oars in place and spare oars for each sloop. Moreover, the canal by which the sloops were to pass out of the lake was already broad and deep. So Cortez sent to advise all the friendly pueblos near Texcoco to make 8,000 arrowheads of copper in each pueblo, and he also ordered them to make and trim for him in each pueblo 8,000 arrows of a very good kind of wood. And for these they also carried away a sample, and messengers and letters were then sent to our friend Jicotenga the Elder, and to his son Jicotenga the Younger, and to his brothers, and to Chichimecatecla, informing them that when the day of Corpus Christi was passed, we were going to leave this city to proceed against Mexico and to invest it. He told them to send 20,000 warriors from their own people at Tlaxcala and from those of Huexotzingo and Cholula, for all were now friends and brothers in arms, and they all knew the time of meeting and the plan, as he had informed them by their own Indians who were continually leaving our camp laden with the spoils from the expeditions we had made. He also gave warning to the people of Chalco and Tlomanalco and their vassals to be prepared when we should send to summon them, and he gave them to understand that we were about to invest Mexico and the time when we would set out, and he said the same to Don Fernando, the lord of Texcoco, and to his chieftains, and to all his vassals, and to all the other towns friendly to us. One and all replied that they would do exactly what Cortes sent to order them, and that they would come. After the orders were given, Cortes decided with our captains and soldiers that on the second day of the Feast of Espiritu Santo, this was the year 1521, a review should be held. This review was held in the great courts of Texcoco, and there were present 84 horsemen, 650 soldiers with swords and shields, and many with lances, and 194 crossbowmen and musketeers. From these there were chosen to man the thirteen launches, those that I will now mention. For each launch, twelve crossbowmen and musketeers. In addition to them, there were also set apart another twelve men, six on each side as rowers for each launch. And besides these, there was a captain for each launch, and an artilleryman. Cortez also divided among them all the boat guns and falconets we possessed, and the powder he thought they would need. When this was done, he ordered the following rules, which we all had to observe, to be proclaimed. First, no man should dare to blaspheme our Lord Jesus Christ, nor Our Lady His Blessed Mother, nor the sainted apostles, nor any other saints under heavy penalty. Second, no soldier should ill-treat our allies, since they went to help us, or should take anything away from them, even if they should be spoils gained by war, whether Indian men, nor women, nor gold, nor silver, or chalchubites. Another was, no soldier should dare to depart either by day or night from our camp to go to any pueblo of our allies or anywhere else, either to fetch food or for any other matter, under heavy penalties. And another, all the soldiers should wear very good armor, well quilted, a neck guard, headpiece, leggings, and shield, for we knew about the great number of javelins and stones and arrows and lances, and for all of them it was necessary to wear the armor which the proclamation mentioned. Another, no one should gamble for a horse or arms on any account under heavy penalty. And another, no soldier, horseman, crossbowman, or musketeer should go to sleep unless he were fully armed and shod with his sandals, unless it were under the stress of wounds or because he was suffering from illness, so that we might be fully prepared whatsoever time the Mexicans might come to attack us. In addition to these, the laws were proclaimed which were ordered to be observed in soldiering, that is, that anyone who sleeps when on guard or leaves his post should be punished with death, and it was proclaimed that no soldier should go from one camp to another without leave from his captain under pain of death. Another, that any soldier deserting his captain in war or battle should suffer death. After the review had taken place, Cortez saw that not enough men who knew how to row could be found for the launches, although those who had been brought to the ships which we destroyed when we came with Cortez were thoroughly experienced, and the sailors from the ships of Narve and those from Jamaica also knew how to row, and all of them were placed on the list and had been warned. Yet, counting all of them, 
there was not a full supply, as many of the men refused to row. So Cortez made inquiries to find out who were seamen or had been seen to go out fishing, and if they came from Palos or Triana or from any other port or place where there were sailors, and he ordered them under pain of heavy penalties to go on board the launches. However highborn they might say they were, he made them go and row, and in this way he got together 150 men as rowers, and they were much freer from hardships than we who were stationed on the causeways fighting, and they became rich from plunder, as I will relate later on. After Cortez had decided who should go in the launches, he divided the crossbowmen and musketeers and the powder, cannon and arrows, and everything else that was necessary among them, and ordered them to place in each launch the royal banners and other banners with the same name that was given to each launch, besides other things which were needed. And he named as captains of the launches those whom I will now mention here, Garci Holguin, Pedro Barba, Juan de Limpias, Carvajal the Deaf, Juan Jaramillo, Geronimo Ruiz de la Mota, his companion Caravajal, and his one Portillo who had just come from Castile, a good soldier who had a handsome wife, and a Zamora who was a ship's mate, a Colmenero who was a seaman and a good soldier, a Lema, a Ginez Nortes, Juan Briones, a native of Salamanca, another captain whose name I do not remember, and Miguel Diaz de Aus. After he had named them, he gave instructions to each captain what he was to do, and to what part of the causeways he was to go, and with which of the captains who were on land he was to cooperate. When he had finished arranging all that I have mentioned, they came to tell Cortez that the captains from Tlaxcala, with a great number of warriors, were approaching, and that Jicotenga the Younger was coming as their commander-in-chief, and that he was bringing in his company his two brothers, sons of the good old man Don Lorenzo de Vargas. Jicotenga was also bringing a great force of Tlaxcalans under the command of Chichi Mecatecla and men from Huesotzingo, and another regiment of Chiluans, although they were few in number, because from what I always observed after we had punished the people of Cholula, they never afterwards sided with Mexicans, nor yet with us, but were keeping on the lookout to see which side to take, and even when we were expelled from Mexico, they were not found in opposition to us. When Cortez knew that Jicotenga and his brothers and other captains were approaching, and they were coming one day before the time he had told them to come, Cortez went out a quarter of a league from Texcoco to receive them with Pedro de Alvarado and others of our captains, and as soon as he met Jicotenga and his brothers, Cortez paid them great respect and embraced them and all the other captains. They approached in fine order, all very brilliant with great devices, each regiment by itself with its banners unfurled and the white bird like an eagle with its wings outstretched, which is their badge. The ensigns waved their banners and standards and all carried bows and arrows, two-handed swords, javelins and spear throwers, some carried mechanas, and great lances and other small lances. Adorned with their feather-head dresses and moving in good order and uttering shouts, cries, and whistles, calling out, Long live the Emperor Master, and Castile, Castile, Tlaxcala, Tlaxcala, they took more than three hours entering Texcoco. Cortez ordered them to be lodged in good quarters and to be supplied with everything we had in our camp. After many embraces and promises to enrich them, he took leave of them and told them that next day he would give them orders what they were to do, and that now they were tired and should rest. Cortez appointed Pedro de Alvarado captain of 150 sword and shield soldiers, and many of them carried lances, and 30 horsemen and 18 musketeers and crossbowmen, and he named his brother Jorge de Alvarado and Gutierrez de Badajo and André de Monjara to go together with him, and these he appointed to be captains of fifty soldiers, and to divide among the three of them the musketeers and crossbowmen, as many in one company as in the other. Pedro de Alvarado was to be captain of the horsemen and general of three companies, and he gave him eight thousand Tlaxcalans and their captains, and he selected me and ordered me to go with him, and told us to go and take up our position in the city of Tacuba. He ordered that the armor we took with us should be very good headpieces, neck coverings, and leggings, for our defense was to go well armored. 
let us next go on to the next division. He gave to Cristobal de Olid, who was quartermaster, other thirty horsemen and one hundred and seventy-five soldiers and twenty musketeers and crossbowmen, all provided with armor in the same way as the soldiers he gave to Pedro de Alvarado. And he appointed three other captains who were Andre de Tapia, Francisco Verdugo, and Francisco de Lugo. And between all three captains were divided all the soldiers and crossbowmen and musketeers. Cristobal de Olid was captain general of the three captains and of the horsemen, and he gave him another eight thousand tlashcalins, and ordered him to go and establish his camp in the city of Coyoacan, which is two leagues from Tacuba. Cortes made Gonzalo de Sandoval the chief alguacil, captain of the other division of soldiers, and gave him twenty-four horsemen, fourteen musketeers and crossbowmen, one hundred and fifty sword, shield, and lance soldiers, and more than eight thousand Indian warriors from the people of Chalco and Huichotzingo, and of some other friendly pueblos through which Sandoval had to pass. And he gave him as companions and captains Luis Marin and Pedro de Ircio, who were Sandoval's friends, and ordered the soldiers, crossbowmen, and musketeers to be divided between the two captains, and that Sandoval should have had the horsemen under his command and be the general, and that he should place his camp near to Itzapalapa and attack it and do all the damage he could until Cortes should send him other orders. Sandoval did not leave Texcoco until Cortes, who was commander-in-chief of the regiments and of the launches, was quite ready to set out for the lake with the thirteen launches. So as to avoid confusion on the road, we sent on ahead all the regiments of Tlaxcalans until they should reach Mexican territory. As the Tlaxcalans with their captain, Chichimecatecla, and other captains with their men marched carelessly, they did not notice whether Xicotenga the Younger, who was their captain general, accompanied them. And when Chichimecatecla asked and inquired what had become of him and where he had stopped, they found out that he had that night returned secretly to Tlaxcala and was going to seize forcibly the cacique ship and vassals and lands of Chichimecatecla himself. The Tlaxcalans said that the reasons for his so doing were that when Chicotenga the Younger saw the captains of Tlaxcala, especially Chichimecatecla going to war, he knew that there would be nobody to oppose him, for he did not fear his father, Chicotenga the Blind, who, being his father, would aid him, and our friend Maziascazi was already dead, and the only man he feared was Chichimecatecla. They also said that they always knew that Chicotenga had no wish to go to war against Mexico, for they heard him say many times that all of us and of them would be killed. As soon as the cacique Chichimecatecla heard and understood this, he turned back from the march more than swiftly and came to inform Cortez about it. Cortez at once ordered five Texcocan chieftains and two from Tlaxcala, friends of Gigotenga, to go and force him to return, and to tell him that Cortez begged him to come back at once and go against his enemies the Mexicans, and to reflect that if his father Don Lorenzo de Vargas were not so old and blind, he would come against Mexico himself, and as all Tlaxcalans were and are very loyal servants of his majesty, that it did not become him to dishonor them as he was now doing. And he sent to make him many offers and promises that he would give him gold and cloths if he would return. The reply Jicotenga sent was that if the old man, his father, and Maziascazi would have believed him, that Cortez would not have so lorded it over them and made them do all that he wished. And not to waste more words, he said that he did not intend to return. When Cortez heard that answer, he had once given order for an aguacil and four horsemen five Indian chieftains from Texcoco to go in all haste, and wherever they should overtake him, to hang him. And he said, There is never any improvement in this cacique, but he must be traitor and ill-disposed toward us, and of bad counsel. And that there was no time to put up with him any longer, or to ignore what had passed. When Pedro de Alvarado knew of it, he petitioned strongly on Gigotenga's behalf, and Cortez gave him a favorable answer, but... Secretly, he ordered the aguacil and the horsemen not to leave Gigotenga alive. And so it was done, and in a town subject to Texcoco they hanged him, and thus his treason was put an end to. There were some Tlaxcalans who said that Don Lorenzo de Vargas, the father of Gigotenga, sent to tell Cortes that this son of his was a bad man, and he would not vouch for him, and that he begged Cortes to kill him.
Let us leave this story as it is, and say that for this reason we remained that day without setting out from Tishkoko, and the next day we set out, both divisions together, for Cristobal de Olid and Pedro de Alvarado had both to take the same road. We went to sleep at a pueblo subject to Tishkoko named Aculman, and it happened that Cristobal de Olid sent on ahead to that pueblo to secure quarters, and had green branches placed above the roof of each house as a sign. When we arrived with Pedro de Alvarado, we found no place where we would lodge, and over this matter the men of our company had already put hands to their weapons against those of Cristobal de Olid, and even the captains were defying one another, but there were not wanting on both sides gentlemen who got between us, and somewhat appeased the glamour, yet not so much but that we still all remained dissatisfied, and from that place they sent to inform Cortez, and he at once dispatched Fray Pedro de Melgarejo and the captain Louis Marin in all haste, and wrote to the captains and all of us reproving us, and when they arrived we made friends. But from that time on the captains, Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid, were not on good terms. The next day, Thursday, 23rd May, the two divisions continued their march together, and we went to sleep at a large town, Zitlaltebec, which was deserted, for we were already in Mexican territory. The day following, we went to sleep at Cautitlan, and it also was without inhabitants, and the next day we passed through Tenayuca and Azcapotzolco, which were also deserted, and at the hour of vespers we arrived at Tacuba, and at once took up our quarters in some large houses and rooms, for this town also was deserted, and there too all our friends the Tlaxcalans found quarters, and that very afternoon we went through the farms belonging to those towns and brought in food to eat. We slept there that night after stationing good watchmen, sentinels, and scouts, for as I have already said, Mexico was close by to Cuba, and when night fell we heard great shouts which the Mexicans raised at us from the lake, crying out much abuse, that we were not men enough to come out and fight them. They had many of their canoes full of warriors, and the causeways also were crowded with fighting men, and these words were said with the idea of provoking us to come out that night and fight. But as we had gained experience from the affair of the causeways and bridges, we would not go out until the next day, which was Sunday, 26th May. After hearing Mass, which was said by Father Juan Diaz, and commending ourselves to God, we agreed that with the two divisions together we should go out and cut out the, or cut off the water of Tepultepec, by which the city was supplied, which was about half a league distant from Tacuba. As we were marching to break the pipes, we came on many warriors who were waiting for us on the road, for they fully understood that would be the first thing by which we could do them damage. And so when they met us near some bad ground, they began to shoot arrows at us and hurl javelins and stones from slings, and they wounded three or four of our soldiers, but we quickly made them turn their backs, and our friends the Tlaxcalans followed them, so that they killed twenty and we captured eighteen. As soon as these squadrons had been put to flight, we broke the conduits through which the water flowed to the city, and from that time onwards it never flowed into Mexico so long as the war lasted. When we had accomplished this, our captains agreed that we should go at once to reconnoiter and advance along the causeway from Tacuba, and do what was possible towards gaining possession of a bridge. When we had reached the causeway, there were so many canoes in the lake full of warriors, and the causeways also were so crowded with them, that we were astounded at it. And they shot so many arrows and javelins and stones from slings that at the first encounter they wounded over thirty soldiers. Still, we went on marching along the causeway towards the bridge, and from what I understand, they gave way for us to reach it, so as to get us on the other side of the bridge. When they had got us there, I declare that such a host of warriors charged down on us that we could not hold out against them, for on the causeway, which was eight paces wide, what could we do against such a great force as was stationed on one side and the other of the causeway, and struck at us at a mark, for although our musketeers and crossbowmen never ceased loading and firing at the canoes, they did them but very little damage, for they brought the canoes very well protected with bulwarks of wood. Then when we attacked the squadrons that fought on the causeway itself, they promptly threw themselves into the water, and there were so many of them that we could not prevail against them. 
Those on horseback did not make any progress whatever, for the Indians wounded their horses from one side and from the other, and as soon as they charged, after the squadrons, the Indians threw themselves in the water. The enemy had raised breastworks where other warriors were stationed and waiting, with long lances which they had made like scythes from the weapons which had been captured from us when they drove us fleeing from Mexico. In this manner we stood fighting them about an hour, and so many stones were showered on us that we could not bear up against them. And we even saw that there was approaching us in another direction a great fleet of canoes to cut off our passage so as to turn our flanks. And knowing this, and because we saw that our friends the Tlaxcalans, whom we had brought with us, were greatly obscuring the um, Gehar's way, and if they went off of it, it was clear enough that they could not fight in the water, our captains and all of us soldiers agreed to retreat in good order, and not to go further ahead. When the Mexicans saw us retreating and the Tlaxcalans escaping beyond the causeway, what shouts and howls and whistles they gave us, and how they came on to join us foot to foot, I declare that I do not know how to describe it, for all the causeway was heaped up with javelins, arrows, and stones that had been hurled at us, and many more of them must have fallen in the water. When we found ourselves on dry land, we gave thanks to God for having freed us from that battle, for by that time eight of our soldiers had fallen dead, and more than fifty were wounded. Through all this, they yelled out at us and shouted abuse from the canoes, and our friends the Tlaxcalans told them to come on land. And even if they were double the number, they would fight them. These were the first things that we did to cut off the water and reconnoiter the lake, although we gained no honor by them. That night we stayed in our camp while the wounded were attended to, and one horse died, and we posted a good force of sentinels and scouts. The next morning, Captain Cristobal de Olid said that he wished to go to his station at Coyoacan, a league and a half away, and... Notwithstanding that Pedro de Alvarado and other gentlemen begged him not to separate the two divisions, but to keep them together, he would not do so, whereas Cristobal de Olid was very courageous, and in the reconnaissance which we made of the lake the day before we had not done well, he said that it was Pedro de Alvarado's fault that we had advanced so rashly, so that he would not stay, and went off to Coyoacan where Cortez had sent him. We remained in our camp for it was not right to separate one division from the other at that time, and if the Mexicans had known how few soldiers we were during the four or five days that we were there apart before the launches could come, and had fallen on us and on the division of Cristobal de Olid separately, we should have incurred great hardship, and they would have done us great damage. So we stayed in Tacuba, and Cristobal de Olid in his camp, without daring to reconnoiter any further, nor to advance along the causeways, and every day we had skirmishes with many squadrons of Mexicans who came on land to fight with us, and even challenged us so as to please us in situations where they could master us and we could do them no damage. I will leave them here, and I will tell how Gonzalo de Sandoval set out from Texcoco four days after the feast of Corpus Christi, and came to Itzapalapa. Almost all the march was among friends, subjects of Texcoco, and when he reached the town of Itzapalapa, he at once began to make war, and to burn many of the houses that stood on dry land, and for all the rest of the houses stood on the lake. However, not many hours passed before great squadrons of Mexicans came promptly to the aid of that city, and Sandoval had a good battle with them, and great encounters when they fought on land, and when they had taken refuge in their canoes, they shot many javelins, arrows, and stones at him, and wounded his soldiers. While they were thus fighting, they saw that on a small hill that was close to Tsipalapa on dry land, great smoke signals were being made, and they were answered by other smoke signals from other towns standing in the lake, and it was a sign to assemble all the canoes from Mexico and all the towns around the lake, for they saw the Cortez had already set out from Texcoco with the thirteen launches. The following description of Cortez's movements is taken from his third letter to the Emperor Charles V. 31st May. As soon as I had dispatched Sandoval, I embarked in launches and set out using both sails and oars. And while Sandoval was fighting and setting fire to the city of Itzapalapa, we came in sight of a lofty hill standing in the water, which was strongly fortified, where many people had got together both from the neighboring pueblos around the lake as well as from Tenochtitlan, 
or they knew who I should make my first attack on Itzabalapa, and they were stationed there in its defense, as well as to attack us if they could do so. When they saw our fleet approach, they began to cry out and to make great smoke signals to warn the cities on the lake so that they might be on the alert. Although it was my intention to attack that part of the city of Itzabalapa which stood in the water, I turned aside to that hill and landed on it with 150 men. And although it was very steep and high, with much difficulty we began the ascent and captured the barricades, which they had raised on the summit for their defense, and fell on them in such a way that none but the women and children escaped. In this combat, 25 Spaniards were wounded, but it was a very beautiful victory, as the people of Itzapalapa had made smoke signals from some idle towers on a high hill near the city. The people of Tenochtitlan and of the other cities which stand in the water were aware that I had already entered the lake with the launches, and they had once got together a great fleet of canoes, and as far as we could judge, there were about 500 of them to come and attack us and to find out what the launches were like. When I saw that they were coming straight towards us, I and the men who had landed on that hill re-embarked in haste. I ordered the captains of the launches to make no movement whatever, so that those in the canoes, in the belief that we were afraid to move against them, might be led to attack us. Thus they began to drive their fleet against us headlong, but at the distance of two crossbow shots they stopped short and remained still. As I was very anxious that our first encounter should be a victorious one, and should be made in such a way that they should be deeply impressed with fear of the launches, for the launches were the key of the old war, and it was on the water the decision would be come to. It pleased God that as we halted, gazing at one another, a favorable breeze should spring up from the land to enable us to join battle with them and I promptly ordered the captains to fall upon the fleet of canoes and follow them until they were shut up in the city of Tenochtitlan. As the breeze was very strong, although they fled as fast as they were able, we dashed into the midst of them and broke up numberless canoes and killed and drowned many of our enemies. It was the most wonderful sight in the world to behold. We pursued them fully three leagues and shut them in among the houses of the city. There it pleased our Lord to grant us even a greater and better victory than we had hoped and prayed for. When the garrison at Coyoacan saw us pursuing the canoes, most of the horsemen and foot soldiers who were stationed there set out on the march for Tenochtitlan and fought fiercely with the Indians on the causeway, and captured the barricades they had made, and with the help of the launches which came close to the causeway they captured and passed across many of the places where the bridges had been removed both the foot soldiers and the horsemen. Our friends, the Indians from Tlaxcala, as well as the Spaniards, moved, followed up the enemy and slew them and forced them into the water on the other side of the causeway where the launches could not go. They followed up their victory for more than a league of the causeway until they reached the place where I had halted with the launches, as I will go on to tell. We chased the canoes with our launches for a good three leagues. Those that escaped us took refuge among the houses in the city, and as it was already past Vespers, I ordered the launches to be recalled, and we approached the causeway with them, where I decided to land with thirty men to capture two small idle towers, which were surrounded by a low masonry wall, Akachinango. As we jumped ashore, they fought fiercely to defend them from us, but we captured them with great effort and risk to ourselves, and I promptly landed three large cannon I had brought with me. The distance along the causeway between this place and the city was about half a league, and it was crowded with the enemy and the water on either side of the causeway was covered with canoes full of warriors, so I had one of the cannon aimed and fired along the causeway, which did much greater damage to the enemy. Through the carelessness of the gunner, at the moment of firing, set fire to the gunpowder we had with us. However, it was only a small quantity. That same night, I dispatched a launch to Itzapalapa, where Sandoval was stationed, a distance of about two leagues, to bring back all the gunpowder he possessed. Although it was originally my intention when I set out with the launches to go to Coyoacan, yet when I landed on the causeway and captured those two towers, I decided to make my headquarters. Akashinango there, 
and to keep the lodges near the towers, and that half the force from Koyoakan and fifty of Sandoval's men should join me there the following day. Having arranged for this, that night we kept on the alert, for we were in great danger, and at night-night a great host of men came in canoes and along the causeway to attack our camp, and truly they caused us great surprise and alarm, because they came by night, and up to that time there had never done such a thing, nor have they ever been known to fight by night unless sure of victory. However, as we were keenly on the lookout, we began to fight with them as did those on the launches, for each one carried a small field piece, and they began to fire them, and the crossbowmen and musketeers did likewise. So the enemy did not dare to advance any further, nor did they approach close enough to do us any damage, so they left us for the rest of the night without troubling us any further. First June. The next day at dawn, fifteen crossbowmen and musketeers, and fifty armed with swords and shields, and seven or eight crossbowmen from the Koyoakan garrison arrived at my encampment on the causeway. When they reached us, we were already being attacked by the enemy in such numbers that both on land and water we could see nothing but the men, and they raised such cries and yells that it seemed as though the world were sinking. We began to fight with them along the causeway, and captured an opening where they had removed the bridge, and a barricade which had been raised at the approach to it. However, with our cannon and horsemen we did them so great damage that we almost shut them in among the first houses of the city. Because many canoes gathered on the other side of the causeway, and did us great harm with darts and arrows which they shot at us on the causeway, and as our launches were not able to pass through, I had a portion of the causeway broken through near our camp, and sent four launches through to the other side, and they drove all the canoes back among the houses of the city. Then they followed in after them, which up to that time they had not dared to do, for they were so many shallows and stakes to impede them. When they found canals where they could enter safely, they fought with the canoes, captured some of them, and set fire to many of the houses in the suburbs. Thus we passed all that day fighting. 2nd June The next day Sandoval with the men he had with him in Itzapalapa, both Spaniards and allies, left for Coyoacan. From Itzapalapa to the mainland there is a causeway, about a league and a half in length, and as Sandoval began his march of about a quarter of a league along it, he reached a small city which also stands in the water. But although a good part of it one can ride on horseback, and the natives of the town began to attack him. He defeated and killed many of them, and destroyed and burnt the town. As I knew that the Indians had broken down many parts of the causeway, and our men would not be able to pass along it, I sent two launches to aid them in the passage, and they used them as bridges, and they went to lodge at Koyogan. Sandoval himself with the horsemen took the royal road along the causeway on which we were camped, and when he reached us, found us fighting, and he and those with him dismounted and began to fight with those on the causeway whom we were driving back. As Sandoval began to fight, the enemy pierced his foot with a dart, and although they wounded him and others that day, what with the cannon, crossbows, and muskets, we did so much execution that neither those in the canoes nor those on the causeway dared to approach us and they showed more fear and less pride than was usual. During the following six days we went on fighting in this way, and the launches went about burning all the houses they could in the neighborhood of the city, and they discovered the canal by which they could enter the suburbs and even reach the main part of the city, which was very fortunate as it put a stop to the coming of the canoes, so that not one of them dared to show themselves within a quarter of a league of our camp. One day Alvarado, who was in command of the garrison at Tacuba, sent to tell me that on the other side of the city the people of Mexico came and went as they pleased, along a causeway which led to some towns on the mainland, and by another small causeway near to it. And in order that the city should be completely invested, I sent Sandoval, though he was wounded, to fix his camp at a small pueblo, Tepeyac, now Guadalupe. At the end of the causeway, so he set out with twenty-three horsemen, one hundred and ten foot soldiers, and eighteen crossbowmen and musketeers, and set up his camp where I told him. 
as I had at my camp on the causeway 200 Spanish foot soldiers, including 25 crossbowmen and musketeers, and more than 250 men in the launches and many friendly Indian warriors, I decided to push along the causeway into the city as far as I was able. With the launches protecting our flanks, and I ordered some of the troops from Coyoacan to join me at my camp and ten horsemen to remain at the entrance of the causeway, and the remainder of the garrison of Coyoacan and ten thousand Indian allies to protect our rear. For some of the pueblos in the lake were still hostile. I also ordered Sandoval and Alvarado to attack in force on the same day. I set out from the camp along the causeway in the morning and soon came upon the enemy at one of the breaches they had made on the causeway, a lance in length and two lines lengths in depth and a barricade they had raised to defend it. Both sides fought stoutly, but in the end we prevailed and followed along the causeway until we reached the entrance to the city where stood another of their idle towers and at the foot of it a great bridge which spanned a broad canal. The bridge had been raised, and the place defended by a very strong barricade. They began to attack us as we approached, but with the launchers on both sides of us, we captured it without loss. Which would have been impossible but for the help of the launchers. As soon as they began to abandon the barricade, the men from the launches jumped ashore and we crossed the canal with more than 8,000 of our allies from Tlaxcala. We shot Zingo, Chalco, and Dechcoco. While we filled in that place of the bridge with stones and adobes, the Spaniards captured another barricade in the street, which is the broadest and most important street in the city. As there was no canal at this barricade, it was easier to carry it. They pushed the enemy along the street until they reached the another canal where the bridge had been removed, excepting one broad beam across which the enemy passed in safety, and then promptly removed it. On the other side of the canal, they had raised a great barricade of earth and adobe. When we reached it, we could not advance unless they threw ourselves in the water, and this would have been very dangerous, as the enemy were fighting very valiantly. And a countless number of them were attacking us fiercely from the azoteas on either side of the street. However, when the musketeers and crossbowmen came up and we fired with two cannon up the street, we did the enemy great damage and observing that some of the Spaniards threw themselves into the water and got to the other side, but it took us more than two hours to overcome the defense. When the enemy saw us crossing over the abandoned barricade and the azoteas and took to flight along the street, then all our men got across and I made them fill in the site of the bridge and destroy the barricade. Meanwhile, the Spaniards and our Indians went ahead among the street a distance of two crossbow shots to another bridge, which was close to the plaza and principal cities, buildings of the city. This bridge had not been removed, nor had my barricade been removed. Nor had any barricade been raised, for they never thought that we should gain as much as we had done that day nor did we think we should get half so far. At the entrance to the plaza, we placed a cannon, and with it did great execution, for the enemy were so numerous that the plaza would not hold them all. The Spaniards, seeing that there was no water there, which was our greatest danger, determined to send, enter the plaza, and when the enemy saw this, carried into effect and observed the multitude of our allies, Although they had no fear of them unless they were in our company, they fled with our allies after them until they were shut up in the well. In the court of the temple, which was enclosed with masonry. This enclosure would be large enough to hold a town of 400 houses. However, a breach was made and the Spaniards and allies captured it and remained there and on the towers for a good while. When the people of the city saw that there were no horsemen with us, they turned again on the Spaniards and drove them from the towers and courts. And as our men were in great danger, for it was worse than retreat, they took refuge in the porticos of the courts. However, the enemy had chastened them so severely that they abandoned these and retreated to the plaza whence they were driven out into the street and were obliged to abandon the cannon which had been placed there. 
The Spaniards, unable to withstand the onset of the enemy, retreated in great danger and would have suffered great loss had it not pleased God that at that moment three horsemen should arrive who entered the plaza, and when the enemy beheld them, they thought that there were more of them and began to flee, and the horsemen killed some of them, and we regained the courts and enclosure. On the most important and highest tower, which has over a hundred steps to reach the summit, ten or twelve Indian chieftains had sheltered themselves, and four or five of the Spaniards clambered up. Although the Indians fought bravely, they gained the summit and slew them all. Five or six more horsemen had now arrived, and they and the others arranged an ambuscade by which they killed over thirty of the enemy. As it was already late, I got the men together and ordered a retreat, and as we retired, such a host of the enemy fell upon us that had it not been for the horsemen, the Spaniards must have suffered great loss. However, as I had had all the bad places in the street and causeways thoroughly filled in and repaired by the time we retired, the horsemen were able to come and go over them, and as the enemy attacked our rear guard, so the horsemen charged back on them and speared and killed many of them, and as the street is a long one, they did not do this many less than four or five times. Although the enemy knew how much they were suffering, they came like mad dogs, and nothing could check them or prevent them pursuing us. In this way, we returned along the causeway at our camp without losing any Spaniards, although some were wounded. We set fire to most of the houses bordering that street, so that when we should return again, they could do no harm from the Azateas. At this time, Cortez was joined by a great number of Indians from Texcoco and Joshumilco who threw in their lot with the Spaniards. As the launches had burnt many of the houses in the suburbs of the city and no canoe dared to venture out, it seemed as though six launches would suffice for the protection of our camp. So I decided to send three launches each to the camps of Sandoval and Alvarado. This proved a most successful plan, for they performed some wonderful exploits, capturing many of the enemy's men and canoes. When this was arranged and the reinforcements had arrived, I gave out that in two days' time I was going to enter and attack the city. Sunday, 16th June. When the day came, after hearing mass and giving instructions to my captains, I left our camp with fifteen or twenty horsemen, three hundred Spaniards and a huge host of our allies, and soon came on a yelling crowd of our enemies. As we had not attacked them for three days, they had removed all our fillings from the breaches in the causeway, and had made the openings much more dangerous and difficult for us to capture. As the launches on either side of the causeway could get close to the enemy, they did great execution with their cannon, muskets and crossbows. Moreover, the men leaped ashore and carried the barricade and breach, and we all got across in pursuit of the enemy. Again and again the Indians made stands behind the breaches and barricades, but we carried them all and drove the enemy from the street and from the plaza where stand the principal houses of the city. I ordered the Spaniards to advance no further, as I was busy with the help of ten thousand allies in filling in the water openings and breaches in the street and causeway. This occupied us until Vespers, meaning the Spaniards were skirmishing with the people of the city and killing many of them. I rode through the city for a short time with the horsemen, carrying along the streets which were then free from water, and the enemy no longer dared approach us on dry land. All I had seen forced me to two conclusions. The one, that we should regain little of the treasure the Mexicans had taken from us. The other, that they would force us to destroy and kill them all, and this last weighed on my soul. I began to wonder how I could terrify them and bring them to a sense of their error. It could only be done by burning and destroying their houses and the towers of the idols, and so as to impress it on them this day, I set fire to the great houses round the plazas, where before we were driven from the city of the Spaniards that I had been lodged. And they were so extensive 
that a prince and 600 of his household and followers might have been lodged in them. Near these were others, which although smaller were newer and more elegant, and Montezuma kept all kinds of birds in them, and although I suffered in doing it in order to see them suffer more, I decided to burn them, and this scared both them and their allies. As it was already late, I ordered the troops to return to camp. As we retired, a numberless host of the enemy fell on the rear guard. But as the street was now in good condition for charging, the horsemen turned on them and speared many of them. The next day I returned to the city in the same way, so that the enemy should not have time to open the breaches and raise barricades. But early as we set out, two of the canals which crossed the street had been opened just as they were the day before, and it was very difficult to pass them, so that the fighting lasted until an hour after noon, and we had used up almost all our arrows and ammunition. It may seem that after being exposed to so great a danger in crossing these canals and capturing the barricades that we were negligent in not holding them, so as to avoid having to repeat the work every day. But it was not possible, or we should have either to move the camp into the plaza, or to have left guards at the bridges. By placing our camp in the city, we should have been exposed to attacks from all sides, both by day and night, and as we were few in number, and they were many, the strain would have been immeasurable. As to guarded the bridges by night, the Spaniards were so exhausted by day that they could not have endured night guards in addition, so we were forced to do the work over the again each time we entered the city. As it was late, we did not do much more this day than capture and fill in the site of the two bridges and set fire to many fine houses on the main road which goes from the city to Tacuba. Although the enemy well knew the loss they suffered when following us, we were tired yet they never omitted to follow and attack us. The natives of Itzapalapa, Churubusku, Mexicaltzingo, Culhuacan, Mishquic, and Cuitloac, all towns of the Freshwaters Lake, seeing that we were victorious over the people of Tenochtitlan and on accounts of the injury that they were receiving from our allies, came to beg for peace and freedom from attack from our friends at Chalco. I received them favorably and told them that my only enmity was against the people of Tenochtitlan and said that they could show the sincerity of their friendship. I was very anxious to clear that street so as to communicate with the camp of Pedro Alvarado and pass from one camp to the other. However, it was a day of great victory on land and water both for us and the companies under Sandoval and Alvarado. We must now return to Bernal Diaz, who was with Pedro de Alvarado at Tacuba, and go back to the 31st May when Cortes fought his first battle.